Uh, so, continuing with the discussion on high level synthesis, if you recall, we had we talked about the CDFG, the way we represent a behavior specification in the form of a graph. We talked about partitioning, we need to partition a large CDFG into smaller pieces, so that each piece becomes manageable. So, continuing with the, with the discussion, we talked today about some other operations we carry out on the CDFG in order to achieve uh, or fulfill our purpose of high level synthesis. They are uh, called scheduling, allocation and binding. So, we talk about scheduling to start with. Okay. So, here our assumption is that we have a CDFG available to us to start with and from there we are proceeding in the beginning in the first step to the uh, process of scheduling. So, first let us try to understand what do we mean by scheduling. Scheduling is essentially the task of assigning behavioral operators to control step. So, what do we mean by behavioral operators? Well, you look or you think of a typical portion of the CDFG, for example, it may look like this an adder, a multiplication and another addition. So, some data inputs are coming like this. So, the outputs of this addition will come here, the output of the multiplier will come to this adder like this. Now, when I say control step, this control step may refer to the clock cycles with respect to the control unit. The control unit will be generating the different signals to control the hardware in synchronism with the clock pulse. Now, when I say you are assigning behavioral operators, behavioral operators are these operations addition multiplication. So, we will be assigning or allocating these operations with respect to some clock cycle. These are the so called control step. So, we will see that there are several algorithms for scheduling whereby we can put these operators in different clock cycles well in order to fulfill certain constraints. So, for scheduling input will be a CDFG of course, and output will be some kind of ordering of the individual operators in terms of time, it is a temporal ordering. Now, this ordering of time will immediately give us information about the states of the finite state machine which represents the controller. Okay. So, this is our objective to obtain a specification from where the FSM can be designed or synthesized directly. So, obviously, our objective is to obtain the fastest design which will take the minimum number of clock cycles. Of course, there can be some constraints like the number of available resources or means if you want maximum amount of parallelism that is a different story. Okay. So, our input as I said will be a CDFG, I am giving a typical example to show how our input to this type of scheduling may look like. Well, this is a classical example which many people take uh, for the purpose of illustrating their scheme. This is a this is a very log code for solving the second order differential equation and the name of this code is called HAL. This came from the source actually. Now, you see this module description has inputs as x, dx, u, a and clock and y is the output. Now, it is an iterative loop in synchronism with the clock, well while x is less than a, you do these three steps of computation and at the end of which for whatever values of x 1, u 1 and y 1 you calculate, you assign them to x u y as the values for the next iteration. So, these steps will continue, you see that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 multiplication steps, 1 and 2 addition steps and 2 subtraction steps. So, from a description like this you can straight away come to your CDFG description, which for this particular example looks like this. So, in this example this rectangular boxes are used mainly for convenience, they actually give the names of the variables which are coming, okay. but the circles are the actual behavioral operators multiplication, addition etcetera. This is a comparator. Now, 
given a diagram like this you can easily understand that in terms of time you have some flexibility. For example, it is not necessary to do this addition in the first step you can even defer it down to the second step if the need arises. Because in this example already there is one path this can represent the critical path which takes 4 cycles to complete or 4 operations to complete. This cycle requires only 2 operations. So, if my whole means iteration one iteration takes 4 steps to execute then if there is one thread of that iteration which takes 2 then I have some flexibility in pushing or pulling up the operations means across the time axis. So, this is essentially the flexibility that we try to exploit in the step of scheduling in order to well well in order to have some kind of desirable characteristic in the schedule. Okay. So, now talking about the scheduling algorithms there are three classical algorithms uh, which we will talk about of course, there are others also we will see. The three classical algorithms are first two are absolutely greedy as soon as possible as late as possible we will explain what these are. The third one is well this is a schedule which works under certain resource constraints like you can say that I have only two adders, I have only one multiplier. So, now you obtain the schedule. Okay. So, if you have more number of resources possibly you can allocate some or means two or more uh, means operations in means in the one uh, means in the same clock cycle parallelly. Suppose you have two multiplications to be done followed by an addition of the result. So, if you have two multipliers available then you can possibly do them in the same step or else what you can do you can do this multiplication in one step the other multiplication in the second step followed by addition in the third step. Okay, fine. So, the resource constraint scheduling is also called list scheduling because it uses some kind of a list. So, let us start by talking about the as soon as possible or the ASAP scheduling which is called more popularly. So, ASAP is very simple in concept. So, here given the DFG you carry out a breadth first search from the leaf nodes of the tree and you carry out a breadth first search from the leaf node which represents the sources of the data down to the sink and you assign time step in that particular order. So, you try to assign a particular operation to the earliest time step possible. You start from the beginning go down the tree and of course, the obvious constraints have to be satisfied which is a successor node can execute only if the parents have completed their execution. Okay. So, the parents have to be allocated a time step which is before that of a child. The ASAP schedule as is defined here this works without any constraints. So, so means it is assumed that unlimited or infinite amount of resources are available. So, that whichever operators can be can, can be allocated you allocate it and as a result what you obtain is the fastest schedule possible because starting from the source you are trying to allocate an operation to a time step which is the earliest possible that is the earliest you can assign. So, the although this is a greedy algorithm the way you are doing it the final schedule you get will be the smallest in terms of the total time required. Okay. But highest node is the data? Highest node is the data, I will take an example to illustrate. But, but as I told you this classical version of ASAP does not contain any resource does, does not consider any resource constraints you assume that infinite amount of hardware are available to you. Okay. So, let us take an example to illustrate what this ASAP scheduling means looks like. So, we are not taking the HAL example let us take a simpler example which will be easier for us to illustrate. So, let us take an example like this. <coughs> this 
the two multiplication steps followed by an addition. There is another multiplication step here. The data coming from here. There is a subtraction out here. These are the sources of the data and a final subtraction here. This is one thread of the DFG and there is another thread of the DFG. Assume that there is an addition followed by a comparison. This is all and there is another thread, but there is a multiplication where the inputs are coming again from the top followed by an addition. So, this is our given data flow graph. So, as you can see this data flow graph is actually a union of three graphs. One is this, other is this, other is this. So, we apply this as soon as possible concept to each of these three graphs. But before doing this, what we do? We divide the time into several steps. <coughs> These are the different time steps we are considering. So, in fact, this example will take four time steps only. So, we show four steps T1, T2, T3, T4. You look at this DFG and try to find out what are the what are the operations you can you can allocate to time step T1. You can say I can allocate 1, 2, 3, this addition 4 and this multiplication 5. So, all this 5, five I can assign to T1 because they do not have any other dependencies from the top. So, I assign them. I am not showing the arrows from the top. So, these are the five steps or the five operations we have already already allocated. Then once these are completed in time T 2 what we can do? We can allocate this addition, this multiplication, this comparison and this addition. So, let us do that. So, this addition is done whose inputs depend on these. We can do this multiplication which other than the input it depends on the output of this operation. This comparison depends on addition and this addition depends on this multiplication. So, after this is done in time step T 3 we can we have only one choice this subtraction. So, you do the subtraction whose input is coming from this and in time in T 4 we have this subtraction again. So, the other input is coming from this multiplication. So, here what we have obtained this is called a as soon as possible or an ASAP schedule. So, what I have said ASAP is a greedy approach it always tries to assign a time step to the earliest time a uh, step of computation to the earliest time possible and the resultant schedule you obtain is the smallest in terms of the total time steps taken. But you see it does not contain <coughs> contain or consider any uh, same as information regarding the number of resources actually available. Say this schedule for example, requires four multipliers in the step T 1 because there are four multiplications you are trying to do in parallel. Okay? Fine. So, this is one extreme as soon as possible. The other extreme is that as late as possible, as late as possible means you try to push the operations as late in the schedule as possible. So, let us also look at this, this ALAP. Uh, so, this as late as possible this works very similar to ASAP, but uh, 
The difference is that instead of starting from the top and going towards the bottom, you start in the reverse order. You start with the root of the tree which in our case is the bottom and you start moving towards the leaves which are the data inputs. And you try to allocate an operation to a time step in that order starting from the latest back down to the earliest. Now, ALAP usually gives the slowest possible schedule takes the maximum number of control. Of course, in this example you cannot uh, just you really cannot appreciate that, but in some other examples you can see that there will be a difference in the times required in SAP and ALAP. And this ALAP well it, it may increase the time step, but it also does not reduce the number of function units. So, this ALAP is not really a good way of making a schedule, but again uh, let me repeat that this kind of simple schedules are typically used as the starting point of some of the iterative algorithms which people also use. So, if there is some kind of an iterative algorithm you can start with this ASAP and ALAP as uh, the input solutions. These represent the two extremes and then you can play around with it you can make some changes to that to obtain a better solution fine. And so, let us see how for that particular example the ALAP schedule will look like. So, let us take that same example. So, for this I am showing the ALAP schedule out here. So, in fact, this in this example also will be requiring 4 time steps. T 1, T 2, T 3 and T 4. Okay. So, now we start from the bottom of the tree. So, the choices we have now here is that we can allocate this, this and this in time step T 4, we start from the bottom. So, we allocate this subtraction, we allocate this uh, comparison and this addition. Four steps I know the solution because otherwise he uh, will basically keep this open and start from the bottom and see how many steps you require. But since I, I, I know the solution I have drawn 4 lines. So, after these are complete you go one step up say that just before that what are the options you have you can do this you can do this this and this. So, all these 4 will be allocated to T 3 step. So, you have this subtraction this multiplication this addition and this multiplication. They will now be pushed down to T 4 you see this multiplication addition and this multiplication they were in T 2 in SAP, but now they have been pushed down to T 3. Now, once these are done in the step T 2 you have the choice of putting in this addition and this multiplication. Okay. So, this addition will be here and this multiplication will be here. So, finally, in step T 1 you have these 3, these 2 multiplications to be put in. So, you put these in here. So, what you get here is your as late as possible schedule. So, you can see if you just compare these two here with respect to the last time step the operations have been pushed as far down the axis of time as possible. But in this example both takes the same amount of time, but there can be some other examples where we will see well, well if there are no resource constraints the times will be the same, but if there are some resource constraints you will see that this ASAP and ALAP may lead to different times. But you try to understand in most of the practical scenarios you do not have unlimited amount of resources. So, you will have to have an algorithm which you works or plays with uh, say some resource constraints and tries to get a solution based on that. 
So, what we consider now is something called resource constraint scheduling and and one of the most popular methods which people use under this is called list based scheduling. This method is popular because this is simple and it can also take take care of resource constraints. Now, you will see that in this list based scheduling algorithm you use the ASAP and the ELAP schedules for obtaining some information and using those information you try to get the final schedule. So, so in a way this method is similar to ASAP because you try to allocate a computation to a time step as early as possible subject to the constraints okay, without violating the constraints you try to allocate them as early as possible. So, if there is no resource constraint then, res then this list based scheduling will be the same as ASAP. Okay. So, first let us see what this method uh, this method actually involved then we will uh, just take an example to illustrate. Uh, the basic concept of this method is to maintain some kind of a priority list of ready nodes. Ready nodes are those nodes means these are actually comp competition nodes or operation nodes say this is a computation node this node will be called ready if all is all its inputs are available that means if it is coming from some other operation this have already been allocated to a previous time step so at this point in time both the oper uh, both the operands are available so this this operator is free to be allocated in the current step and we maintain not just a list but we also try to assign some kind of a priority this we will see how but uh, the concept of priority goes like this see in the dfg well you can you can understand that there will be some critical paths like in the previous example there were some paths uh, which are of height 4 like i'm showing you in this example you see this was the critical path or this was a critical path there are four time steps in sequence now the total time was four so i will try to assign maximum priority to the operators which lie in the critical path because if you give any slack there then the total time may increase from t from means 4 to 5 but in the other ones this addition comparison comparison multiplication addition here you have some flexibility you can push down the order this one if you need so based on that we can assign some priorities to the operators that means which is the operator which has a higher highest priority means if you don't allocate it now possibly you will be ending up with a longer schedule that is the idea and during its each iteration what you try to do we try to use up all resources as far as possible with respect to the dfg that is given to us and if there are some conflicts if there is only adder but there are two additions which are ready then we try to assign the one with the higher priority right okay so now let us uh, try to take an example and illustrate that how this uh, actually looks like well in fact we will be using that same example as we have taken earlier but i am redrawing it for the purpose of understanding a few things so first let us uh, quickly draw the dfg once more So, I am just showing it side by side. So, this was the DFG. Now, 
Now, I just give some numbers to each of these nodes just uh, for future reference 1, 2, 3, 4, these are the multipliers 5, then uh, 6, these are the multiplications 7, 8, subtractions 9, 10 and 11, these are the operators which are available here. Now, what we do? This is our given DFG. <coughs> now, what we do? We look at each of the operators. For an operator node i, you consider any operator node i, you define something called mobility of the node i which you denote by writing some number within an angular bracket. Now, this mobility i is defined as follows, mobility is defined as time for elap schedule minus time for ASAP schedule. See this times means I am just I am talking about this particular node. This particular node when was it assigned? For example, if you look at this node number 1, <coughs> node number 1 was assigned time step T 1 in both ALAP and ASAP. So, mobility is 0. Node number 4, this was assigned time step T 1 in ASAP but time step T 3 in a lap. So, mobility is 2. So, in this way, this, this way you will have to construct the ASAP and the ALAP schedules and subtract the times that each each operation was assigned and accordingly you get the flexibility or the mobility of each of the nodes. So, I am writing down the mobility of each node side by side just for reference. These lie on the critical path, so their mobilities are all 0. But for these nodes, there is the mobility of 1. These nodes mobility 2. Okay. So, now based on the mobility, you can construct a so called priority list. See, there are so many multiplications 1, 2, see for multiplication you construct the priorities starting with the highest priority, highest priority are the ones with less values of mobility. So, you see there are 3 multipliers with mobility 0, but to start with not all the multipliers are ready priority list will contain only those operations which are currently ready. So, there are 3, in fact 4, this 1, 2, 3 and 4, but 5 is not ready. So, the, the initial priority list will contain node number 1 with a mobility of 0, node number 2 with a mobility of 0, node number 3 with a mobility of 1 and node number 4 with a mobility of now, other than this the only other operator which is ready in the beginning is, is this addition. So, there will be another entry for this addition uh, node number 10 with a mobility of 2. Now, the idea is that as you go on allocating the operators to time step some of the some of the entries will get removed from the priority list and some new entries will get in. Like for example, if we assign this 1 and 2 now this 5 will be the new node which will be coming in. So, if you assign 3, 6 will be the new node which will be coming in. So, this is the starting point and we assume also some constraints on the available resources. We assume that we have 2 multipliers, 1 adder 
one subtractor separate and one comparator. So, under this constraint we will have to allocate. Fine. So, now let us see that how this allocation can be done. I am constructing the list schedule based on these constraints. So, I have this graph, I have this priority list. So, with respect to the priority list uh, just let me try to see. I will try to again construct the time steps. So, I do not know how many steps will be required T 1, T 2. Okay. So, in the beginning in the first step well only I can assign these two from here they are the see there are only two multipliers available recall. So, I cannot assign all three multiple multiplications in time step T 1, but since the first two are of the higher priority I assign them node number 1 and node number 2. See, I try to allocate all other resources the the only other resource I can allocate is this addition. Okay. So, addition 10. Node number 4 has a priority of 2. Mobility is there because, because it is not mandatory or means it is not that important to allocate this node number 4 in time step T1. Even if I push it down, so that it will not matter in terms of the total time. But if I push node number 1 down, it will hamper my schedule. So, in this way after this, uh, so after you allocate 1 and 2 and 10, what will happen? These entries will get removed from this table and some new entries will come in. For example, 1 and 2 have been removed, the new entry that will come in is 5. 6 will not come in still because 3 have not yet been completed. So, now this 5 will have a higher priority with respect to 3, but since we have 2 multipliers you can you can assign both 5 and 3. These are the next 2 means high priority. Mobility is reduced, but uh, okay, you can do that also, but that same thing will happen for all the numbers actually. So, means either you decrease all of them or you do not disturb any one of them. Yeah, yeah. So, so just uh, as you basically go down, you can decrease these numbers. Yes, this 3 was 1 with respect to time step 1, but as you go to time step t2, now 3 becomes 0. Yes, true. We, because now 3 becomes a critical node also. So, in this way you continue, you can allocate the comparator out here. So, I am just showing the schedule now. Now, at time step T 3, you can have the other multiplication here, uh, that is the 6, which will come from here. You have uh, the subtraction, this one this subtraction, uh, this one, this 7, this will come from this 5 and you can also start uh, this multiplication which was out here, this 2, this 4. This is happening because of the constant, because already 2 multipliers were allocated here, so this multiplication had to be pushed down here. So, now you can have uh, <coughs> this 8 which will come from 6 and 7 and from 4 there will be 9, this is T 4. So, you see this is uh, a schedule which uh, is a list schedule which has been obtained taking into account some resource constraint. But in this example incidentally you require the same number of steps, but in general if you put some resource constraints it can be more than the SAP and LAP also. So, now you can see that the way you have allocated uh, the operators with time steps you do not require more than 2 multiplication in each step or more than 1 addition or subtraction. right? So, 
this is actually how the list scheduling works. Now, there are some other schedules also I am not going into detail of them, I am just mentioning. Uh, but here we try to approach from the other side, here we give some idea or guideline regarding the maximum number of time steps uh, we can have and from there you try to obtain an allocation and at the same time minimizing the number of resources you require. So, there are actually three methods which have been proposed force directed scheduling, well force directed scheduling means if this connectivity from operator to the next it will try to bring it closer by some kind of a force. So, the basic concept was like this and integer linear programming it frames the problem as an ILP and tries to solve it. Iteratory refinement like simulator learning some algorithms like that was also proposed, but uh, for scheduling still list scheduling is the one which is used most widely because of its simplicity and because it gives quite good results. These are the other methods which uh, were, were which are reported and explored. Okay. See steps and the resources required these are conflicting requirements. So, if we want to one if you, if you want to go for some kind of a compromise then you can go for some kind of iterative improvement or iterative refinement, but what uh, the method of list scheduling does it tries to minimize the number of time steps subject to the resource constraints. Given the resource constraints you get the minimum time, but uh, some of these methods do the other way around you that means uh, you give the number of time steps as input. It is true, it is true the cost of the hardware has gone down. So, actually the resource constraint is not that much of a, so I say it may not play that much of an, have an important role as it used to do earlier, but still suppose if you have a multiplier, multipliers are still expensive a 32 bit or 64 bit multiplier. So, if you see that uh, I am requiring 10 multipliers in a step, that may be still a little too much. because not only the floor area, you also need to worry about uh, the total power consumption. So, if you have lot of uh, resources, hard complex hardware is working in parallel, power will also go up. Okay. So, uh, so now let us uh, look at a few of these points. So, here we had made some simplifying assumptions so far. The assumptions were like this that all the computations can be assigned to a particular control step. So, means we are assuming that if, uh, that means a multiplication and an addition they are of the same complexity, but, but in but in practice they can have different values of delays. So, we can have a number of different approaches to tackle this problem. So, several heuristics were proposed I am uh, just trying to briefly mention what these are, it is unit delay multi cycling chaining and pipelining. These are fairly simple in concept, this can be incorporated with SAP, LAP or list scheduling algorithm to get a modified schedule. So, let us see what these are. The unit delay concept says that, uh, well this is actually what we had seen so far, you assume all operators are of the same delay. So, a typical schedule will look like this adder, adder, multiplier. So, an adder and a multiplier both can be placed in the same clock step. So, here you are making the clock cycle bigger, they are basically making the clocks slower in order to incorporate the slowest operation. So, obviously, this is not a very good method. So, what you can suggest as an improvement is something called multi cycling. Multi cycling says that you do not reduce the clock, but rather you try to make the control slightly more complex like there is no problem with this part fine, but this multiplication you make it span two clock cycles like this. So, now you remove that constraint that 
that an operation has to be allocated to a single time step. You can allocate it across a number of time steps also. Benefit is that uh, the basic clock uh, frequency can be made higher. Suppose assuming that multiplication takes twice as much time as addition, then you can have the maximum possible speed out here. Chaining does something similar, but in the reverse way. This says that you allocate multiplication in a time step, make the clock cycle in a way where this multiplication can be done. But with respect to addition, you put two additions in the same step, you chain them together. So, that in the same clock cycle two additions will be done. So, some extra controlling <coughs> is required. So, the control unit design will become a little more complex. And as an extension of this multi cycle concept, you can have pipelining concept also like I am giving an example. Suppose I have a multiplication which I am allocating like this across two time steps. There is another multiplication whose inputs do not depend on the result of this. So, I can possibly allocate it like this also, there can be an overlap. Okay, so, these are the flexibilities which you have and you can understand these are heuristics. Normally, you start with a given schedule, then try to optimize using these concepts or in some cases you can incorporate this also in the basic algorithm, right. So, yes. Clock frequency is not increasing, but the resolution of your control unit is increasing. That means, in the same clock step, you are doing several things. So, you can think that there is a slower, slower clock, there is a faster clock, two clocks are running. Yes, you can do that also, yes. These are, these are some basic concepts which you can also do together. So, I am just independently talked about this. Uh, and one last thing I wanted to talk about, this is something called allocation and binding. See, see after you have done scheduling, you have obtained some kind of uh, you can say an allocation of the different operations to the different time steps. But after that in order to get the final hardware corresponding to the data path, you need additional steps called allocation and binding. Now, what is the basic idea? The basic idea is that see means you have a CDFG, still now we have a CDFG nothing else. Now, you will have to select the actual hardware components to be used in the RTL level design, because ultimately we are trying to arrive at the RTL level design. So, we will have to select the basic components here. There are variables, there are operators, there is also interconnection between them interconnects. So, I will have to take care of all these things in order to arrive at the final hardware, registers, ALUs, multiplexers, variables will be residing in registers, operators will be mapped to ALUs, interconnections may require additional multiplexers, right. So, let me take a simple example to illustrate it, you will have an idea that how it works. So, let me take a simple example there are only two time steps T 1 and T 2, there is an addition followed by a subtraction, there is one input operand A, another B. This is I am calling E and the other input to this subtraction is coming from here itself, this is also A and whatever is coming out this is say x and say here I have c and d. 
here again a similar thing is there I am calling this F the same D is fed back I am calling this Y and in addition there can be a feedback like like here whatever value of X you are computing this will be fed back to this B in the next iteration. Similarly, whatever you are computing here Y this will be fed back to this C in the next iteration. So, from this DFG you can straight away you can come or arrive at an ALU design you see there are four computation steps let us call them 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now, these are address and subtractors typically addition and subtraction can be done by the same same hardware unit same ALU. So, I am assuming that there are two address subtractors available with us these are the ALUs we need two ALUs because two things has to be done in parallel both will be having the capability of addition and subtraction. Now, in terms of the operators I am mapping 1 and 3 out here and I am mapping 2 and 4 out here. Now, the first input to this will always come from A right. So, I am assuming that there will be one register which will be storing the value of A in a <coughs> dedicated form, but the other register which you have out here now in terms of this it can store B, it can store E or this X when it is fed back X, B, E, X this is the second input and the output of this whatever is coming out this will be loaded back into this. So, there will have to be a data path from here back to here. Similarly, here the first input to this ALU can be C, F or Y. The second one will be again dedicated similar to this mirror image D and whatever is coming out that will have to be loaded back here. So, see here what I am shown is that I will require four registers R 1, R 2, R 3 and R e and X they can share a register. Well, if this is the complete computation where you do not need B anymore then this is valid. And through some analysis uh, these are called uh, means lifetime analysis of variables these are fairly standard techniques used by compilers that you find out that during which time steps a variable is active active means you need to keep them in a register, but if the lifetimes of different variables are disjoint they can share a register. So, in this allocation and binding you try to find out which are the variables that can share a register well, well if they can share a register you can put them together. Now, assuming B e x and C f y can share a register this is the optimized data path, but suppose B is required somewhere later also. Just assume that B is required sometime later you cannot override the value of B with E or X then at least for this part of it the modified data path would have been like this. So, instead of writing like this what I would have got is that I would have one register for storing A. I would have one register for storing B also because B is required as I had said and there will be one register which will be sharing the values of E and X. Now, there will be a multiplexer I would need a multiplexer out here which will take either the value of E B or E X and then it will fit to the ALU. So, one input will be coming from here other input will be coming from here. So, after the lifetime analysis if you find out that there are some variables which cannot share a register then you may need to allocate dedicated registers and you will be requiring some multiplexers to 
to select one of them to the output. So, these are the different things uh, which need to be done in the steps of allocation and binding. I am not going into the details of the algorithms because there are a number of uh, algorithms and heuristics which have been proposed. They are used primarily to optimize this data path. That means, what is the minimum number of registers required? If you cannot share a register, what is the minimum number of multiplexes required and so on. So, using these kind of operations in sequence, you can finally end up with a data path which will contain the functional units, which will contain registers to store the operands and which will contain also interconnections and multiplexers to route the different values in the diff different places. Now, with this uh, we finish uh, our discussion on synthesis for the time being. Uh, starting from the from our next class uh, what we will be talking about, we will be talking about uh, the step or the steps we follow once the synthesis is over. Means, we go towards the back end design, we now plan that how we will be mapping our design into our target you can say. Target, target may be silicon, it can be FPG, it can be anything. So, we will have to plan how we will have to target our netlist which we have obtained into our target. Typically, we will be assuming our target to be to be silicon, we want to design an ASIC, but the different steps and algorithms we will be looking at in our next classes.